has been on the cover of almost every scientific uh, magazine and has been featured on National Geographic. And I'll tell you, to me, it's the biggest honor ever to have him come and speak to you guys about his research as a scientist and what he does. So I'd like you all to please give Dr. Lems again a round of applause. discovery uh, for years. Uh, this is it, and in short, you can describe it as the earliest child ever found in the history of paleoanthropology. And I will explain why we think that way in a few uh, minutes. Uh, the nickname is Salam, which means uh, peace in many Ethiopian languages because she was discovered in Ethiopia. But before going to that specific discovery, I think it's important to tell you why I do or we do with my colleagues the type of job we do and what is that really would like to know. When you are a paleoanthropologist or anthropologist in general, what you're trying to do is to try to understand and answer the question, what makes us human? And in the following few minutes, I'll try to show you the characters that we try to identify or explain when we try to understand what makes us human. Of course, as you all know, we are first our looks. So if you have this various types of people in the planet Earth, on the planet Earth today. Yes, they differ in some aspects, but they belong to the species Homo sapiens, as you know. And one of the key elements of what makes us human is the way we look. And to me, everybody on the slide looks exactly the same. I cannot see the differences because I look into the bones, not the outside part of. The, the faces. If you went into the body and examined the cells, you see that Homo sapiens, or everybody here in the planet, are characterized by some code, the genes, the DNA. We share of course, a DNA heritage with many other animals in the planet, but we specifically share an overwhelming amount of DNA 
material with uh, chimpanzees. When you do the DNA analysis of Homo sapiens and the, the chimps, you see that over 98% of the same genetic material is shared. And that is the case because we share a common ancestor sometime around six to seven million years ago. So in addition to the way we look like, our genes are another important attribute when we try to define what makes us human. So even though, of course, we belong to the animal world, we specifically are coded. Of course, the code is the DNA, and that distinguishes us from other animals. But mind you, when I say distinguish us, it's just a fraction of that DNA. Over 98%, for example, is shared with the chimpanzees. Another important attribute, when you try to understand what makes us human, of course, in addition to the face, the way we look, in addition to our genes that are inside, are our behaviors. And these behaviors could be Intuitive behaviors such as this one, look at this the gorilla feeding its baby, and we do it also. But behavior for homo sapiens, or for us, goes beyond the intuitive behaviors that we know, such as this one. <laughs> Around 2.6 million years ago, our ancestors invented these stone tools. And as you know, we today have rockets, computers, big amphitheaters, etc. So all this computer, this all scientific advancement that we have today is a simple continuation in time of this invention that was made 2.6 million years ago. And the fact that we have this unique behaviors is also one way of defining us as humans in addition to the genes and in addition to the way we look like. <coughs> and as you all know, we are the only species that can speak. No other species has an articulated language. And we can speak or we have language because we have a set of anatomical features, the vocal tract characterized by the shape of the hyoid bone, the larynx, and other parts, cartilages and bones in this region that enable us to speak. But we speak not only because we have this type of morphology, but we have something in our brain also. So language is controlled not only by morphology or anatomy that we have here, but also by what's going on up here. So when you define what, when you try to define as to what makes us human, in addition to the face, the genes, the behavior, we have this uniqueness in possessing or in owning a language, languages anyway. And there is something unique to humans, and that is symbolism. And symbolism means that we are interested in how we are perceived from outside. And what you have here, might seem nothing, but these are beads, decorative beads that are dated to 75,000 years ago. In other words, sometime around 75,000 years ago, our ancestors, Homo sapiens, were already concerned about how they looked <coughs> and how they were perceived from, uh, from, the, uh, from outside. In other words, the behavior that I told you at the beginning, the stone tools, the caring for the children, etc., is something. But if one starts to care about he or she is perceived from outside, then it already tells you something complex was starting 75,000 years ago. So in addition to the face, the way you look like, the genes, the behavior, and language, symbolism is one important attribute when you try to define humans. And of course, 
all that, I told you the brain controls language, the symbolic nature, our behavior, etc. And as you sit down and just hear, a lot is happening inside your brain. Homo sapiens have a very big, very large brain compared to their body size. And the fact that we have this big brain enables us to <coughs> somehow be different from other animals. But of course, I should underline when I say different, I'm only talking about the differences, but we are different from other animals because in the first place we are the same. As I told you, when you do the DNA analysis of chimpanzees and humans, only 2% differs, 98% is the same. But of course, when you characterize differences, you have to show how things are different. So this gray matter, this brain, is not only large in humans, but it's very powerful. Very powerful that it can do this, save lives, or do this. So in a way, the future of humanity lies somewhere around here. And we have to be careful on how we understand ourselves and our brain and how we use it. Having said this, <coughs> I would like to come to one attribute in addition to the facial morphology, or anatomy you have, the genes, the behavior, the language, the brain that distinguishes from other primates, we have one important attribute when we try to define what makes us human, and that is the anatomy of our skeleton. This is a reconstruction of a species called Australopithecus afrancis, which is a Lucy species. <coughs> and when you look at the skeleton, when you do detailed analysis, you can very easily tell that these individuals were upright walking uh, species. They were bipedal, like, like that they, were walking, uh, they were walking on two legs. And here is a, an infant human skull. Here is an infant chimpanzee skull, skull. And here is Salam, the discovery that I will be talking about today. And you can clearly see that this individual is closely related to this one. I will, I will tell you why later. But the fact that we have a unique set of anatomical features or characters is one way to define us as humans. But what is very unique about this type of attribute or evidence is that that is the only attribute that makes us makes it into the fossil record. I told you about language is the important attribute of humanness, but it doesn't fossilize. It doesn't go to the fossil record. The brain, it decays. It doesn't go to the fossil record. The behavior, of course, cannot be there in the fossil record. So the fact that we have this important attribute, the skeleton, the bones, fossilizing, and then being preserved in the sedimentary context in us not only to talk about what makes us human, but also about what made us human, because thanks to these bones, we can travel back in time and see how the different stages of development happen through time. Remember earlier I told you the genes, the DNA is one important attribute that we have, but the <coughs> thing with the DNA is that it tells you that we diverged from the chimpanzees sometime around 7 million years ago, so it gives you the starting point, and then it gives you the end, that today we are closely related, telling you nothing about here. So when you go out to the field like me and many of my colleagues, what we try to do is to find the fossils and then try to establish the different stages of development through time. And when you do that, you can 
see clearly that things were indeed changing through time, from six to seven million years all the way up to today. And what you have here is the brain is expanding through time. You have a larger and larger and larger skull. That the face is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. Compare this face with this face. And also, you don't see them here, but the teeth are becoming smaller and smaller through time. So this clearly helps us to tell a story, which is a story of everybody in the planet, over six billion people. So the fact that the anatomical evidence of fossils are preserved in the sedimentary context help us to figure out what happened through time. How do you do that? In the following part, what I will do is to try to show you how we do this based on my own work and how we actually do that in the field. <coughs> see this image? You see practically nothing. <coughs> right? But if you went there and have a close-up, you find something like this. And this, Okay, this is an elephant, oh, this is me. This is, <laughs> this is, this is a cranium, a skull of an elephant. You can see the hole, the hole at the base of the skull right here, which is called the foramen magnum, and this actually is the tooth. You can see it here. <coughs> so, even though this place seems nothing in there, when you actually go there, you find something like this. But you don't only find elephants, you find also rhinos, antelopes, monkeys, rhino, carnivores, etc. So one would, of course, wonder how can one find this, this animals in this region? When you do the geology and date the sediments, you see clearly that the sediments are older than three million years ago, and that means that the ancient environmental conditions were very different from what you have here today. Because if you had elephants here, then the environment must have been very different. That's why they were there after all. And when you actually study the many bones that you encounter in these places and try to reconstruct the ancient environment, you end up with something like this, clearly showing you that the area was covered with trees, rivers, lakes, and our ancestors, including the Lucy species, were flourishing in this type of environment. So thanks to the animals that we find there, we can have an idea of what type of environment prevailed during those days or years. So it's in this area that my team discovered uh, Salam, this one, a skeleton. And this skeleton represents the earliest and most complete infant hominin ever found in the history of paleoanthropology, as I told you earlier. It's a skeleton of a three years old girl who lived and died 3.3 million years ago in an area called Dikika, which is in the northeastern part of Ethiopia, and belongs to the species known as Australopithecus afarensis, which is a Lucy species, in other words. Once you've found something, of course, you have to keep searching for more. So that's what we did. And we were screening, sifting, and uh, searching on the, on the hillside. And that took us four to five years. And you can see people, including myself here, basically crawling all the way from the spot where she was found first, all the way down to 200 meters. And you do this over months and months and months and for four years. And after doing that, we were happy because we continued find, finding bones that belong to the same individual. Here is the sheen bone. Here is part of the shoulder blade. You can see the ribs that are still in contact. This is the lower jaw. You have a complete foot with the metatarsals here. You have a still articulated 
shin bone and the thigh bone. Basically, after she died, she was buried something in this position, if you wish. Uh, of course, when I say buried, there was no formal burial. This is three, over three million years ago. So the river would have uh, uh, taken her away and put her in the sedimentary deposits. So when I say buried, it means sedimented. So anyway, we were happy. Over four years, we were able to recover over 60% of the skeleton. And compared to Lucy, Lucy is 40% complete. This is a 60% complete in addition to the face. OK. Once we have that, then the next question is then how do we actually know these are hominids or they belong to the human ancestors? OK. First of all, forget this. Look at the chimpanzee of the same age. This is an infant chimpanzee. This is a tongue child. And this is George Bush when he was a child. <laughs> and so what, 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 OK. So I just chose it because uh, I didn't have any other picture. So anyway. <laughs> So what, what, what you do, what you do is basically you compare uh, humans, other known fossils, and chimpanzees, and you clearly see that you have a forehead here. And the child has a forehead also. And this individual has a forehead, and this is missing in apes. And this is because of the development of the prefrontal cortex. And you don't see a very projecting canine here. OK? You don't have it here, but you have it here. So we can tell they belong to the human family tree very easily based on the anatomy of the bones. And you can also tell that they indeed belong to an upright working species when you do the detailed analysis of the uh, bones here. I will not go into the details, but there are many features clearly showing that she belonged to an upright working individual. So we know that she belongs to our family tree. Uh, by the way, uh, you laughed at the picture, but if you touched your forehead, everybody has a forehead here, right? Yeah, no other animal or primate has a forehead because this part of the brain is not well developed, so they don't have a forehead. They have a more <coughs> posteriorly receding uh, frontal region on the forehead. They don't have it. With the forehead, does that mean like our hips evolved too? Because like the bird? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, you're right. But I, I, you can ask me later about that. <laughs> So anyway, so if we know that she belongs then to the human family tree, how do we know whether she was a girl or a boy? That's an interesting question, I think, right? We know because, uh, you, you know, in gorillas or chimpanzees or other primates, there is something called sexual dimorphism. It simply means that males are larger than the females, and males have larger canine tooth than the females, and what we did was that we went deep into the mouth with that CT scanning technology here, because what you have here are the baby teeth. But inside here, you have the still growing adult teeth. So when we measure this teeth, which is a canine tooth, it was clear that it was a very small canine. And we know in the Lucy species, males had larger canine teeth compared to the females. So she was a girl. And to know how old she was when she died, I will ask you a question first. If you went out to the street now and grabbed a six years old or boy or girl, how many teeth do you think she or he would have in her mouth or his mouth? Twelve. Okay. <laughs> no. 
No, no one got it. <laughs> she, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, the answer, the answer is 44. And this is because, look at that. When you're a baby, you have the baby teeth, but also inside, you don't see them, you have the still growing adult teeth. It's when the teeth grow and push the baby teeth that you shed your teeth. So based on that logic, you can very easily ask how much time would be required to accumulate this amount of teeth in a child's mouth, and that was about three years of age. So the individual died when she was about three. And one interesting thing, earlier I told you, speaking was one of our attributes as homo sapiens. And of course, language does not, does, language does not preserve, as I told you. But we have this bone called hyoid bone, which is a tongue bone supporting your tongue from behind in a way. And the shape of this bone, I will ask you, this is Salam's bone, the new discovery. Do you think this is closer to this one or this one? This one? This one. But very good. And this is, a, this is from a chimpanzee. So this species had very human-like face. The teeth were very human-like. The forehead was very human-like. But they had some features that are ape-like. And that clearly demonstrating that evolution is in the making. And it's demonstrated even in this discovery. If you see a mixture of features in the skeleton, then something was changing slowly. And I don't know if you know about the tectonic. Uh, it's a very, very old ancient fish. Uh, discovered by Sheldon, and it's similar. So things were changing progressively, it wasn't a jump. So anyway, this shape then clearly tells us that if this individual produced some voice, it would have been more like chimp than a human uh, voice. So in conclusion, I would like to say the following things. What we have here is a 60% complete skeleton compared to that of Lucy, who is 60% complete. But what we have here is a face clearly documenting for the first time that the anatomy of infants was like this 3.3 million years ago. In addition to this completeness, this skeleton also includes the height bone, the shoulder blades, the fingers. So it's basically a lamp. This is a, a skeleton which will give us so much information and help us understand how we looked like over three million years ago and how our ancestors also looked like over three million years ago. And the fact that it's a child, it's a juvenile infant, also gives us additional information because, as you know, Children have bones that are softer than adults. They are not completely fused, and they don't really make it into the fossil record often. So this is a rare opportunity to look into how infants looked like over three million years ago. And in addition to being very important to paleoanthropology, this discovery is also symbolically important to the whole humanity because its specimens like this clearly show that we, all homo sapiens on the planet Earth today, maybe we look different facially, but we are all united by our ancestors and we belong to the same origin and the same species today. And we share very common ancestry all the way up to six to seven million years ago. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to. Thank you.
inspired you? What? What? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I can't say What inspired you to become a oh, oh, what inspired me to be a paleontologist? Uh, the, 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 the answer is a very strange answer, and I will tell you why. Uh, building inspired me. Building. Uh, I grew up in Africa, so we are not as lucky as you guys. We don't have prominent scientists come to talk to us like uh, you guys have the opportunity today. So I didn't know much about paleoanthropology when I was maybe your age. But after I studied, I finished college, I did geology. I was assigned at the National Museum of Ethiopia, and my office was full of bones that came from the Lucy site. So I was spending hours and hours and hours just sitting there. So the building and the fossils that were in that room inspired me to be a paleontologist. So I was not a single person, but it's the the fossil themselves that inspired me to be a paleontologist. Thank you for your question. Findings, uh, finding a baby skeleton, her question is what, what, what's unique about discovering a baby skeleton? And this is really a very important question. I do, don't have it here, but when it was published uh, a year and a half ago, it was on a cover page of the New York Times, Washington Post, and many famous newspapers and magazines, including the National Geographic. And the discovery of infant in is unique because, first of all, they don't make it to the fossil record. Why? Because first, when they leave, they are prime candidates of the predators. So they are butchered by the carnivores. Second, the scavengers. And third, even if they escape from the scavengers, their bones are not fully fused. They are very fragile, so they break very easily. So, it's a combination of this that they don't, they don't make it to the fossil record. So once you have them, however, not only do they tell you about the, 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 the infants, but they tell you a lot about the adults also. Because as you see, this individual has 44 teeth in its mouth. An adult would have 32. But the fact that you have both baby teeth and adult teeth in the same mouth captures a unique moment in the individual's life history, but also the species to which she belongs after the Pithecus Afrans. So that's why babies are unique in the fossil record. Thank you for asking the question. Thank you. Uh, how do you know some of the features like body hair? <laughs> body hair. Uh, as I told you earlier, the good thing about working on bones is that you can go deep in time and track how things were changing through time because they fossilize. However, and unfortunately, soft, the soft, soft part of the body, including the hair, does not make it into the fossil record. So if you saw a hair implanted in any of these individuals, it's just an artistic impression of the artist. Scientifically speaking, we don't know. And saying I don't know is a very common thing in science. Actually, it's not. It's mostly we say I don't know. And that is the motor of science. Thank you. How do you know it's 3.3 million years old? Very good question. We know because the, you, you know about radioactivity, right? So we use a method called argon argon. In other words, we measure the time period when that specific sedimentary rock was formed. And you can do that using the radioactivity method. So the age of the, the individual is the age of the sediment when she was buried. It could be plus or minus 5,000 years, but in 3 million years it doesn't mean anything. So we know thanks to the radiometric methods of argon, argon, or potassium argon methods. Thank you. Uh, okay. Mike, <laughs> like, okay, can we carry Closer? Yeah. 
but still uh, we don't have the answer. There are some works showing that it, it might have been shorter than in humans, but that is an inferential conclusion. We infer from the fact that in humans it's slightly longer because we have this care, we have all this technology, we have the family, everything, but it would have, it would have been a bit shorter in this ancient species. But the answer, the scientific answer would be I don't know, but it would have been shorter. I don't know exactly how much or how many, how many months. But it's a very good question. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the area in which you found Lucy's baby? Because I don't understand that it wasn't really simple for you to um, like get into that area because there were like conflicting tribes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. okay. Very good. Uh, you've read something. Right? <laughs> okay. uh, yes, the area I work at and where I made the discovery is very remote and hostile, pretty hostile, and then also there was no access. Actually, to go to the spot where she was discovered, I made the road myself with the help of the locals. So using shovels and picks, I made the road. So it was it was not fun. It was exciting, but it was not it was not fun. So. Uh, yeah, it's a very difficult place to work at, and there is nothing, no village or no no camp that is permanently staying there. So I basically carry uh, a village with me when I go there. All the tents, the food, and everything from the capital. I decided that. Uh, when I made the discovery, uh, I was the only scientist in the field, accompanied with some locals from Ethiopia. Uh, so, in short, the, the place is very, very pretty harsh. Yeah. And um, you speak the language, so it's not really hard for you to communicate with people. Actually, I don't speak the you language. You don't? Is that <laughs> because, why you have the locals with you? Yeah, with, because in Ethiopia there are over 70 different languages, 70. I speak three of them, but I don't speak, I don't speak 70 of them. But, of course, it helps if you're from there, it helps. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in the past, we have seen that there's like, there's been a lot of species, uh, a lot of species have gone extinct. How do we know that Lucy is just not another species to, that just has similar traits to humans and humans? I mean, other than DNA analysis. Okay, well, first of all, we cannot do the DNA analysis on this species because as of today, the DNA analysis can take you only up to 50,000 years. Because the DNA is a soft, organic material, as you know it from your biology classes, it does not preserve, it does not make it to the fossil record. So DNA is out of question here, we cannot use it. But when we try to understand whether the Lucy species was indeed our ancestor or just a side branch. We have various methods, including what is called cladistics, whereby you analyze many of the features and try to relate them whether they indeed link us with the genus Homo or like the robust species called Paranthropus species, they are just side branches. So we have methods, including the cladistic analysis, to show that the Lucy species indeed was a link to the genus Homo. So we're basically we're relying on the traits they had, right? The traits on the bones. How, but there's been a lot of species in the past that have similar traits like that. How yes, but what you, when you when you try to do the link between two species, what you do is you deal with what are called derived features that connect you. For example, a fish could be a cousin because we share a common ancestor millions and millions of years ago. An amphibian is the same, a mammal is the same, a chimpanzee is the same. So when you narrow down and come closer to the relationship between the Lucy species and the genus Homo, you have to specifically identify those features that are shared only within those two species. 
So it takes, of course, much more detailed analysis to do that. Okay. And um, I'm sorry, this is my last question. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Where did you study at? I studied in Paris. <laughs> well, I, I, did, I did geology, as I told you. First, my undergrad was from Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, then I went to Paris, then went to Arizona, and then I'm now in Germany. How you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, I want to ask I'm enjoying you. it, actually. Huh? I'm enjoying this. Me too. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you two questions. My first question is, are y'all hiring? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, um, my, my real question is, though, um, how do y'all just go out, how y'all just pick areas to go find these discoveries and stuff? How y'all just, okay, we're going to start here, start there. I mean, how y'all do that? Very good question. When I showed you that image where there was nothing. That's waiting for you there. But before we go there, we use satellite images, aerial photos, to actually see if there are potential sediments. For example, you don't go there if there are just volcanic rocks and basalts. You cannot find fossils in basalts. And if it's metamorphic rock, you don't go there either because it's so odd, so transformed with the temperature and pressure, you don't find. So you first of all identify sedimentary rocks. So with that information, based on the satellite images and aerial photos, in addition to the reports that are coming from the geologists who were there not for the fossils, but for the mining or the petroleum, they report on the geology of the local area. So based on those three informations, you go and start to look around. So once you find an indication that there is some fossil indeed, you concentrate on that specific area and continue. And once you find something like that, then you spend four years on that just one spot. I mean, water, I mean, it's dirt. Yeah. Just, I mean, I don't know. Yes, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We get a round of applause. And thank you so much. This was a wonderful audience. Many questions and really exciting. Thank you. <laughs>